Being Black in America comes with its challenges. However, we understand that enlightenment through education is the oppressor's worst fear. By bridging the gap between academia and the people, our purpose is to equip you with knowledge that breaks down barriers during your journey towards truth and freedom. Welcome to the Black and Highly Dangerous Podcast. Hey, yo, Dev, what's going on? What's going on? How's your week been? Um, My week has been fairly busy, but it's, you know, kind of wrapping up, about to get ready and head to Dallas for a little, you know, weekend getaway. Nice, nice. Yeah. So yeah, I've been getting ready, got a couple little trips I have to do to a couple like workshops, conferences. And then by the time this episode airs, you know, I'll be tanning in Jamaica. <laughs> I'm not. Oh my God. Jamaica is so nice. So that's nice. what I hear. That's what I hear. So I'm looking forward to it. It'll be my first time out there. So looking forward to a little, little sun, a little, little ocean, a little, some good food. You know, I'm going to get some of that real curry chicken. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So uh, we stopped in Jamaica, like on a cruise that we went to and we got a day pass at one of the resorts. And it was like one of the best decisions that we ever made. We were able to eat at one of the buffets and like, it was nothing like it was n- not like a golden corral or anything. Like they had real food, like real food. They had the oxtails, they had like fresh fish. It was it was good. That was the best part of the whole trip. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my boy um, from Jamaica, he told me, he and me was like, make sure you get, you try KFC when you're out there. And what? Like for, I'm like, for what? He was like, just so you could compare and see the, the trash you guys eat here in America. <laughs> that is- <laughs> Apparently their, their KFC said it's like way much, way better and chicken so much uh cleaner and taste better tasting and all this other kind of stuff i was like well that's definitely not gonna be first on my list of stops when i'm out there but if i pass by one i might try to get some just to see see what he's talking about (laughs) you know i actually have heard that fast food restaurants in other countries are way better that they use better quality ingredients and part of it is because of like of course the uh citizens expectations but also some countries just don't allow like pink slime and like crazy things that are allowed in our food over here yeah that's true and i think um i don't know if it was mcdonald's or burger i think it was mcdonald's they're um doing this thing now i think i've seen an ad where they are bringing like having rotations of some of the foreign cuisines from the other mcdonald's oh yeah to, to america yeah, I, uh, <laughs> I was like because i know everybody because everybody always talks about how like i know like you just said like in other countries they have not only like probably higher better quality food but definitely different things on their menus um and so now they're bringing some of those items for like limited time and like kind of rotating I was like that's that's interesting you know, mm-hmm. but I'd probably still rather try it in these countries because it's still probably better. Yeah. <laughs> How they make it. Mm-hmm. I bet their customer service is better too. <laughs> probably. Yeah. And I bet the ice cream machine works too. All the time. <laughs> All the time. <laughs> oh my God. Um, I think there was, I can't remember. I think I just saw something crazy happen with. I don't know. It's always crazy, um, like little viral videos of things that are going on. Oh, I saw this video with some woman. I think it was at a McDonald's. And then she was like, she was a customer, but she was doing a drive through. She was like coming through the drive through window, like trying to attack the workers, and was like throwing milkshakes and drinks. And then the, the workers were throwing it back at her. It was like, it was like, what is going on here? Man? Yeah, it, it's it's wild. I feel like people think they can treat uh, fast food workers any type of way. I feel like sometimes people go into those restaurants and they take all of their frustrations out from their day on those people because maybe they didn't get an order right or something like that. It's like, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. All right, yeah, that's crazy. Um, but to our listeners, so, you know, this week is going to be a little different for this episode. Um, we're not going to have any old oh Lord news or anything because we're actually recording a little earlier than usual uh, because staff and I are going to be doing a whole bunch of traveling in this week. And, uh, and if we didn't want to do old oh Lord news, that would be like super outdated for you all so we're just going to skip that portion and then hopefully next week's episode you know we'll probably have a lot a 
a lot to catch up on a lot of a lot of news but um I guess I do want to shout out to Coco Golf, you know, even though she lost um, in the round of 16, you know, she, you know, still proud of what she has accomplished, to say the least. And, you know, we're going to be seeing a lot more of her um, in the near future. So that was she was fun to watch. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And there was something, too, about um, because she's like uh, only 15, she can only do a certain amount of uh, like tournaments a year. Oh, so we don't everybody's like we don't know the next time we'll see her like the u.s open is in august but she's not sure if she'll be at that one because she has to like spread them out for the remainder of you know the year uh to stay fresh and keep that level of competition so mm-hmm. um, you know but hey she's making i think you know i forgot i think i saw something she made like I think before this, her winnings was like seventy five thousand. I think now she got around like three hundred thousand dollars in winnings for what she did. So that's a lot for a fifteen year old. So shout out to Coco. I know, girl. <laughs> um, you know that is an amazing you know purse to take home for someone that age. You know that'll pay for college. That'll keep her out of debt. That'll you know help build up her net worth, which is you yeah. know our our topic somewhat for today. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Definitely a pay for college, and she's homeschooled too, which is I think her mom was a teacher or is a teacher, something like that. So that's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, definitely on this entire topic today because we've had, as we've been talking about, probably the past couple episodes, especially with politics and um, what some of these candidates are discussing, putting on their agenda um, to become the next president. You know, things like housing, things like tuition assistance and stuff like that. So Daphne and I kind of want to take a, a take a take a step back and kind of look at uh, the bigger picture, uh, because, you know, America is not a new country. And the kind of things we've he- been hearing, we probably heard before. And of course, we see some debate and backlash when some of the politicians are talking about race specific policies that benefit people of color and I think we just want to address how some policies in the past has really benefited white folks, although it's supposed to benefit everyone and how they had race specific uh, benefits um, from policies that we weren't allowed to, to dive into, which help them build wealth to where they are today and create the gap that we see and try to just, I guess, provide some perspective so that as we are hearing these current day discussions, at least we have a little bit more knowledge as far as what happened in the past, what language did they use, and how we can prevent from getting duped again with these new kind of politics in today's era. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, another reason that we thought uh, that this was important is because, you know, we've mentioned terms like the wealth gap, and uh, but it's also important for us to kind of understand the foundation behind these gaps and leading back from um, slavery and reconstruction into now. And there's like always been this term, you know, when the U.S. has the flu, I mean, has a cold, I think black people have a flu. And it's just kind of like, over time, like the flu turned into pneumonia and, and stuff like that. And, you know, our community is still trying to recover. And I hope that this will be a lesson to others to say, like, you know, why these policies are needed and, you know, not to feel jealous because um, there have been policies in the past that in indirect ways targeted other races and sometimes in direct ways targeted them. So when black folk are asking for something, don't hate, just, just listen and learn, you know? <laughs> just listen. <laughs> and it's a good reason to why we're probably asking for these things too. It's based in some, you know, historical and current day uh, facts for sure. Um, all right, so what do you think we should start with, Dev? I know, I guess we can briefly talk about, because you mentioned things like, uh, you know, maybe like reconstruction and stuff like that. You know, we don't got to give a, a major history lesson in that, but I think it is worth mentioning kind of the beginnings of that period, because um, it is like, you know, the first time like post-slavery era and how these gaps began to, to increase mm-hmm. between black and whites. Mm-hmm. So I think the biggest thing to like understand, of course, like Reconstruction was the time, you know, after the Civil War, about 1865 to 1877. And uh, one of the biggest, I guess, 
um, historical uh, moments that impacted, I feel, uh, reconstruction and what the period was supposed to be. Lincoln, uh, who signed the Emancipation Proclamation, um, it, it, reconstruction was supposed to be a time of healing. And, you know, for those of you who do not know, radical Republicans at the time saw it as like kind of a time to punish the South because of their, you know, atrocious acts or whatnot. Not. Um, and I'm pretty sure you've heard of things like 40 acres and a mule um, mm-hmm. and policies that were supposed to be put in place to help African-Americans, formerly enslaved individuals to establish themselves. Um, and pretty much after Lincoln was assassinated, like a lot of things went left because Andrew Johnson, he was a Southerner. I think he even owned slaves himself. And it was just kind of like reconstruction went from a time where we were supposed to be providing African-Americans with education, with land, um, you know, with the tools to build themselves up. And it ended up turning into a time where we got, you know, black codes where um, I mentioned a book before slavery by another name to where, you know, there were these Jim Crow laws and there were these punishments where people were uh, formerly former slave owners were essentially re enslaving African-Americans uh, for things like vagrancy and uh, crazy things. Yeah, it was in those vagrancy laws were used because they were like, you know, essentially, if you weren't allowed to work in one end, I mean, that means you were kind of unemployed. And so if you got stopped by a police officer or whomever and they were like, you know, you don't have a job then that's a vagrancy and you can get locked up for that. And then they would essentially have you work, whether you're incarcerated or have you cheap labor just so you wouldn't get um, hit with the vagrancy. Uh, uh, charge or what have you. Um, and, you know, this, and during this, you know, uh, W.B. Du Bois has a book called Black Reconstruction, which kind of looks at a, I think about a four to five year period within the reconstruction of, um, it's a huge book. Uh, I remember like reading through it, some parts of it uh, in a class in my undergrad. And, um, you know, he pretty much highlights what was happening for Blacks. And there was a time period where Blacks shortly right after um, it began, Blacks were diving quickly into a lot of these new freedoms, education, businesses, running for political offices and were winning. And then um, because a lot of things weren't set in stone yet, we knew slavery had ended, but they weren't sure, you know, whites weren't sure how to fully integrate Blacks into society yet and where they stood. And as they were figuring that out, Blacks were taking uh, advantage of a lot of these new freedoms. Mm -hmm. Uh, But that short, that lasted very shortly, uh, you know, uh, pretty much it, it was a lot of blowback. They began to destroy these institutions, um, figure out ways to take away, take away resources from the black communities, get them out of office, stop them from voting, lock them up, all this kind of stuff. But there was this time period where we were doing well. Um, and I think, you know, one of the, uh, I guess, conclusions from Du Bois's book was that although it didn't work out, it still gave, you know, white folks, um, the impression or white folks had to understand and know that blacks, when they had um, the right access and resources that they can do just as well as even better than white folks. Right. Because it was that kind of belief that we were inferior and innate and given these tools, we couldn't use them properly or didn't know how to use them. And in that brief time period, it showed like, oh, no, actually, when we get educated, you know, we, we can go toe to toe just with you all and probably even more so. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I, I think another big part of this was the fact that the land that was owned pre-war was redistributed to the Southern land owners. And so um, one thing that people might not know, so the 40 acres and a mule, uh, the mule was not um, like a, a actual thing. I think they were going to let them borrow mules, mules, but the 40 acres, there was actually a stretch of land along the coastline from uh, Charleston, South Carolina to St. John's River uh, in Florida. And it included Georgia Sea Islands. And um, African-Americans actually did take possession of that land uh, after the order was put into place. However, uh, 
so like around like June, I think of maybe 65, um, 40,000 freedmen had settled on like that 400 acres of what they called Sherman land because it was uh, a order order by William, uh, General William Sherman. So they took possession of that Sherman land. Uh, but again, once Andrew Jackson got into place, that was overturned and uh, the land was returned to the white uh, slave owners. <clears throat> yeah, see, that. See, that's important. This whole thing about land and even, you know, we talked about reparations before and ta Coates and others and um, this whole idea of, of what it means to own land and how that is important how it was important back then but just that alone who had access to land who didn't have access to land really is probably one of the basic foundations of where we begin to see this wealth gap Mm -hmm. um, between blacks and whites and then it continued in various forms over time Mm -hmm. right um Mm -hmm. and and, uh so i guess this can lead us to you know so i know uh many of you have heard of and history classes, et cetera, of, you know, the Great Depression and things along that line. Um, and then so shortly after the Great Depression, um, you know, FDR, uh, President Roosevelt created this thing called the New Deal. Um, and it's kind of like, like you said, kind of how Reconstruction was supposed to be a time of healing after the Civil War. Uh, after the Great Depression, you know, the New Deal was this idea of trying to build our economy back up and essentially this kind of economic healing in a way mm-hmm. uh, because our country was so down in the dumps that we needed to figure out ways to, to do it. And, you know, one of the biggest things that FDR did during this time um, was, and this is important because we'll, we'll talk about it again later, was put a lot of regulations on financial institutions like banks and et cetera, uh, because one of the reasons that we got into the Great Depression during this time period, or before we got into the Great Depression, was because banks were um, pretty much abusing um, the system in a lot of ways, and uh, they became too powerful. And there, this was the you know the first time banks be, were becoming banks, those financial institutions that we see today. And so the government didn't really know how to act, right? Um, it's kind of what we see with the internet, right? The government trying to figure that out because it was this new institution, and um, so naturally in the capitalist society they took advantage of a lot of ways and then they became so large that they wound up collapsing and so one of the main premises of the new deal and fdr getting us to regulate these financial institutions so that they couldn't harm you know the american uh, public like they did in the past Mm -hmm. um but with the new deal you know there was a lot of uh kind of I guess, proponents to it. Um, So I definitely talked about one being um, the banking reform, but there were like other things um, that were a part of it that that was supposed to help, you know, everyone in America to get back on their feet. So we had the banking reform, we had monetary reform uh, that put like the Securities and Exchange Act, again, Securities Exchange Commission, the SEC, which again, we probably heard of when you're talking about financial institutions, but there were other things as well. And uh, this one um, kind of goes along the lines what Daphne was talking about is that they were trying to essentially um, give money or give funds or subsidize what have you to farm and rural programs. Mm-hmm. Right? Uh, and you got to remember, especially during this time, it was a lot of the economy was probably agricultural business, like agribusinesses, mm-hmm. a lot of farmers and how we operate. So that's important uh, because both blacks and whites were making a living off of the land in this way. And so, you know, the government began to give money to help boost this part of the economy up to certain farmers and landowners and st- and, and things like that. And there were some discrepancies um, within that as far as uh, race is concerned. Now, Daff, are you familiar with any of the discrepancies or what happened with the racial divide when it came to the farms? Well, I do. Well, so I do know in terms of like the New Deal, they, you know, created like Social Security. And I know that I believe agricultural workers were excluded. And I know the majority of like black men were like in agricultural work. Were you talking about that? Yep. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Exactly. Uh, So essentially, yeah, that was one of the things is that uh, I think it was called, you know, it's the the Agricultural Adjustment Adjustment Act. Act. Yeah. Yeah, was aimed to help farmers by cutting farm production and forcing up food prices. So essentially what this means is that less production 
uh, meant less work for thousands of poor black sharecroppers. Mm -hmm. Right. So essentially these farmers were getting paid to have less workers. And so they were cutting off all the black folks. And so they know were no longer allowed to work. Um, I think it was like first fired, last hired is the, is the term that started to come about this time period with blacks in particular. Mm -hmm. Cause that's when like union laws like started to go into place, but, uh, do you really think unions were going to protect like black people? Yeah, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> um, also important to that is domestic labor or domestic work was also excluded from like the Social Security Act. Who do you think were domestic workers during that time period? Mm -hmm. Black mm -hmm. women. Yep. Yeah, I mean, we've seen, you know, all the these movies and all that kind of stuff, right? Like things like The Help, et cetera, were women of color typically played those roles, but that was a reality, mm -hmm. right? Those kind of domestic workers, housekeeping, what have you, uh, nannies, all the above. And then they were excluded from a lot of these government benefits mm -hmm. um, while whites were eating these things up. And the same thing when we talk about even the Agricultural Adjustment Act, because what it did also, although it cut, you know, so thousands of poor black sharecroppers couldn't work. Uh, but then, like they said, the same things that they increased food prices as well. Mm -hmm. So it's like now you are... Uh, People are losing jobs, right? While white folks are making money, black folks are losing jobs, and now food costs more. And so it puts you even in a more drastic and dire situation just by doing something like that alone, how many lives were affected by uh, those policies. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Of course, we don't want to say that, you know, the New Deal did not help black people at all. Of course But not. it's kind of like... It's that trickle down thing we always talk about. It's kind of like they got the drops, but the vast majority of the policies from uh, labor to housing and et cetera did not benefit uh, African-Americans. No, it did not. Because um, I think uh, one thing I was looking at uh, how, you know, it contributed to even these injustices. Yeah, with the housing part, um, with the Federal Housing Administration, FHA. Mm -hmm. uh, and it pretty much it served to build rather than break down the walls of segregation. Mm -hmm. uh, that started around, the, you know, Jim Crow era and stuff like that. And I'm sure, you know, we've probably mentioned, but I'm sure you guys have heard of things like redlining and stuff like that. Yes. Um, uh, you want to talk about that quickly, Dev? That is OK. So uh, what essentially happened is so the FHA, it was established. And so, of course, they established guidelines about lending practices and they put into place policies that essentially uh, kind of excluded predominantly black neighborhoods from being able to receive loans. So African-Americans could not receive loans for their neighborhoods. But of course, they were not getting loans to be able to live in white neighborhoods either. So that only contributed to the housing segregation that we see today, as well as like the complete um what do you call it? It's kind of like the devaluing of African-American neighborhoods. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And so this is one of the instances where we see both, you know, kind of explicit and implicit, you know, racism play a part, because when we look at the housing on one end, like you said, um, institutionally, uh, black folks were just not getting allowed, to, uh, were not allowed to get these loans, right? Or were getting denied loans. So although they were applying, but because they were black, they were getting, saying no to, to mortgages and stuff like that. Therefore, they can only get a certain amount of loan or certain, if they could, it probably was not that much and they had to keep them in a certain area. And then the implicit ways that happened too is the fact that, uh, you know, realtors were intentionally not showing black people who were looking for homes, homes in white neighborhoods. Right? Mm -hmm. So they were only fo focus them and show them homes in black areas or lower income areas, et cetera, to keep those lines of segregation, to keep the white areas white and the black areas black. Um, and so without that lack of knowledge or understanding, those are things, especially during this time period that you really can't put your finger on until, you know, years later and you see the data or you see what was happening. You you hire a real estate agent and you're like, okay, I'm looking for a home and he's showing you all the things, but you're not realizing that he's intentionally missing certain areas, mm -hmm. right? Uh, with better school systems and better home values, et cetera. And so these are the things that they were keeping black folks segregated. 
um, especially yeah, when we talk about redlining and like places like Chicago, which was it was huge. You, you still see the effects mm-hmm. of that today. The amount of segregation they mm-hmm. have with their neighborhoods. There's actually this book called The Color of Reform uh, that kind of discusses you know, the issues that Tom mentioned, I think within the context of Chicago. And these are a few terms that you might want to look up in terms of, you know, how housing segregation and the devaluing of black neighborhoods, how that, um, you know, kind of played out. So there was restrictive covenants and that was kind of contractual agreements among property owners stating that they would not permit blacks to own occupy or lease property. So we're talking about something that was officially put in place, a red line in which we already discussed, uh, block busting, which was a concerted effort of realtors to induce fear in white homeowners by purposely renting to low income blacks in white areas. And this would cause whites to move and it kind of increased the rates uh, and profit of realtors. Yeah, that's crazy. That is crazy, man. (laughs) That is wild. Um, So it's kind of like we still see these uh, uh, impacts today. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we'll discuss this in a minute, but it's kind of like we we kind of saw this also play out just like 10 years ago uh, in the 21st century. But kind of like this housing situation was, you know, especially detrimental because it was following the New Deal era that white wealth really began. And part of that was through home ownership Mm -hmm. equity that they got, you know, in these homes that cost like $2,000, $5,000 back in the day. Uh, And it's just kind of like, it's crazy because I just saw this story about this woman. She's 102 or like 100 and she's being uh, evicted from this house that she rented in California, although she's rented from a black man and he you know, did it under market rate. But when you think about this 100 year old woman, black woman probably doesn't never own her own home because of some of these policies. And she's now facing eviction. So, Mm -hmm. you know, it's just kind of like we we still see the effects today. Another thing that people don't talk about, there's this book. Have you ever heard of this book? It's by Ira Katz and Nelson. um, And it's called When Affirmative Action Was White. No, I haven't heard about that one. Okay, it's it's an amazing book and everybody needs to get it. And uh, one of the policies that, uh, you know, he really highlights in terms of how the government kind of instituted uh, seemingly race neutral policies that led to unequal opportunities for, you know, black and white people. And one of them was the Selective Service Adjustment Act. You know what that is? Um, uh, I mean, I'm pretty sure selection would be the draft, right, kind of thing. It was a GI Bill. That was just another name for the GI Bill. Oh, okay, okay, okay. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Yeah, and so that was, you know, aimed at reintegrating uh, like about 16 million veterans and is considered one of the most like wide ranging uh, social benefit policies ever. A lot of people actually still benefit from like GI bills. Um, and yeah, it in- as you can guess, it included a lot of benefits that African-Americans did not uh were not able to take part in, although, Mm -hmm. you know, they fought for this country. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about some of those or I can't. Yeah, I mean, I I can start off with some of the things with the GI Bill, because, again, the GI Bill, and you hear about a lot of people, um, I think this was for what, um, after World War II, I believe, Mm -hmm. to help veterans. Mm -hmm. Um, Again, I think FDR was the creator of this one as well, and is used to help get veterans back on their feet. Hey, you've done this uh, amazing service to our country, so we want to make sure that you're taken care of, so you get a special set of benefits whether it's, you know, uh, helping with getting a job or definitely one of the biggest things was uh, education, getting access to and, you know, uh, assistance to go to school and college and stuff like that. Um, Again, this was something that 
was supposed to be given to everyone, but largely uh, white veterans were the ones who were benefiting. Uh, I think off this one study I read, it said 28% of white veterans went to college off of the GI Bill, but only 12% of black veterans mm -hmm. did so as well. Um, so there was this unequal uh, application of the bill itself when it came to black and whites. Yeah, because, I mean, you have to think about the fact that this this policy was implemented while Jim Crow was still in effect. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of I don't they didn't I won't I won't say they canceled out each other because I believe, uh, you know, enrollment at HBCUs actually grew during the time that the GI Bill was like instituted. And, you know, that was partly made possible by federal assistance. But like Ty said, the what, 28, 29 percent versus 12 percent. It's a huge difference. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of people actually view this time as when the American middle class was created. Yeah. Um, because as a part of like the GI Bill, in, in addition to education, again, there was like VA mortgages um, and they VA mm -hmm. mortgages pay for about five million homes. Uh, mm -hmm. Some people have said that the GI Bill actually created or filled the suburbs. Mm -hmm. um, and Ty, you made a comment last week about how Kamala Harris has said like, oh, you know, with her home, uh, black, white, I mean, yeah, black home ownership act mm -hmm. or whatnot. Yeah. Um, how she was like, oh, you know, people can use the equity in their home to pay for college. And we were like, no, we don't want to do that. And we don't want to do it now. But that yeah. is kind of how intergenerational advantage was created during that time period, because they were able to use equity in their homes to like mm -hmm. put their children through school or to help their children buy, you know, homes or even to like let their children inherit homes. Homes. We're thinking about people who bought these homes in the 40s and the 50s who inherited those homes. The people yep. that are still living right now. Yep. Mm hmm. And I mean, and like when I'm looking at even I'm looking at some of the stuff with the GI Bill, you know, it like you said, it was still during Jim Crow. So it's like this is one of the reasons and we mentioned this last week and I think we'll continue to mention is um, you got to look at kind of the gatekeepers in a way. And when there's bias, it's, it's going to show in the results later on. And so because there was still segregation, because a lot of people who had these positions of power were white and believed that blacks were not capable. Like one of the things they um, in this article says that 86 percent of skilled professional and semi-skilled jobs went to white veterans, while 92 percent of the non-skilled and service positions went to black vets. So just even the type of employment that they were getting pushed through when they were going to see these certain supervisors, whomever, the, the, the higher paid labor was going to the white vets while the lower paid labor was going to, to black veterans. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Um, and it's it's kind of like. I don't want to say those are lost generations, but when we think about the cumulative effect of losing the land that we had claimed after the Civil War. These, you know, black codes and Jim Crow laws that were implemented, how those very same laws prevented African-Americans from fully participating in the benefits that they earned through uh, their service. But even, you know, thinking about the other like New Deal policies that they weren't able to uh, participate in, it, you know, I feel like those are the very foundations of like these black, white wealth gaps that people discuss all the time. Exactly. Like um, kind of when you're talking about with the housing stuff in the GI Bill, I just found this. It says that, you know, uh, pretty much black vets were, you know, pushed away from getting GI sponsored home loans, which, OK, to help pay your mortgage and stuff, uh, to get a mortgage. And then, you know, but this white vets were the main uh, beneficiaries of this right mm -hmm. and so they were able to like you said own the property pass it down to their children and grandchildren and that land became of value um this one statistic says that in the summer of 1947 3,000 va home loans were issued in mississippi right only two of those loans went to black vet veterans at that time period mm -hmm. two out of 3,000 home loans f from the vas from the veterans and this is mississippi so you know there's a lot of black people in Mississippi and only two, 
right? So this mm-hmm. goes to show how the systemic uh, segregation and racism really stopped people from getting, especially black folks. And it's really sad because they put their lives on the line to serve this country just as much as these white men. But then came back and were still being denied and pushed away to give them this opportunity to help, you know, their uh, families and their future generations, mm-hmm. and children and grandchildren like the white the white veterans did. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and uh, one another term you can kind of look up uh, and I kind of use this in my research. It's called street level bureaucrat. And like. Uh, Those are people who work on the front line who have the discretion to implement policies as they see fit. And because, you know, back then and even still now, street level bureaucrats, they come to work with their own biases. They come to work with their, uh, you know, prejudice prejudices or whatever. And, you know, they can decide who benefits and, you know, who does not benefit and, if policy is implemented in a very uneven way based on these biases, then, you know, it leads to things like uh, the median uh, black ho- uh, or the mean of black household wealth being one hundred and thirty eight thousand dollars. But that same number being nine hundred and thirty three thousand dollars for white people. That's a huge gap. Yeah, that's big. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that is beyond huge, but yeah, that's a huge gap. And I mean, this is this is crazy. And, you know, this has to be thinking like, I don't know, eventually we have a lot of people on, but maybe we should find like some black folks in the military or who have been in the military who, who I don't know, some, you know, I just want to get that pers- their perspective on like kind of what goes on in that world, you know, mm-hmm. uh, because it's just like when we think of things like, you know how people talk about blue lives matter, but then we had the black officer on and saying like, "Listen, that that doesn't apply to me, right?" And then when people were mad at Kaepernick and they're, "Oh, the veterans this and the veterans that," but are you really Im- imagining or valuing black veterans, or is it just the white ones, right? Mm-hmm. And when I think of when I think of even just the imagery of a lot of when they show veterans and and, and pictures and situations, it's typically white veterans that they're showing and yeah. that people sympathize with. And there's tons of black veterans out there. Why? Because uh, if you, and I've, I've read this somewhere before, but I know that like, um, you find like a lot of military recruitment offices in, in communities of color. Oh, uh, mm. p- picking up all these kids and these and the you know the young children, whoever teenagers, whatever. Because oh, listen, you might not get the college; it's not for you. But here's the benefits of you know what you can get from going to the military um, and preying on them in a way, right? Where it's kind of showing them this is your maybe your only option. Uh, and so I just want to have more discussions on that. Or maybe one episode in the future, get somebody on to get get perspective on that. It is so true. I I remember at like my high school awards day ceremony, like what fifteen years ago, and you know people, of course, they were talking about their college scholarships. But I noticed a lot of the uh, black boys in my class, they were provided with like these uh, so called sign uh sign on checks and so you know they're walking across the stage with a twenty thousand dollar check supposedly Mm. from you know the military but then you see them a couple years later and you're like you know what's up what happened and like Mm -hmm. oh it you know a lot of stipulations a lot of little things and even when i was doing my field research this year I spent a lot of time in the guidance office and I swear almost every day there was somebody from, you know, a different branch of the military asking to come in and talk to uh, the boys. And it was like they wanted to specifically target uh, what they saw as uh, youth that were not college bound. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the military can be a good thing. Like my brother-in-law and, you know, most of his family, they went through the military and they've used it to all become like physicians. He just had his cardiology uh, graduation. So he's a cardiologist and this was all paid for through the military. But if, if students don't truly know how to, serve and also get what they need out of the situation, then they just end up being used up. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's generally what happens. Um, I remember when I was in high school, 
And it was my senior year. I was out playing basketball with some of my boys. And, you know, this recruiter came up and, you know, was selling us the dream in a way. <laughs> um, and he got everybody's number. And I just remember he was like, you know, he was like real slick. He was kind of fairly young, probably in his mid-20s. And, you know, trying to get us and he was just like trying to get us over like, oh, let's play Madden, you know, play video games. And he would call. <laughs> and I just remember like one time he called the house and then my pops, cause my pop, you know, he was he, he's a vet. He was in Marines and <clears throat> he saw here he was a recruiter. And my dad was just like, no, like he stopped calling. He's not going into your military. He's like, I was in the military. He's going to college. He's like, I know what you guys are trying to do. And, you know, it's not happening here. And he just shut it down immediately. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's just funny how also, how also they really like, you know, they try to ease their way into to getting you to join. Um, and I, and, and it's just weird because I just, I feel like you don't see that as much in probably white or suburban communities, you know, Mm -hmm. the presence of recruiters that heavily. I'm sure people, you know, you see things like ROTC and stuff like that and and high schools where you have those programs and students be a part of it. And, you know, they kind of choose to continue. Um, But I don't, I never, that recruit, that recruitment was never that heavy. So Mm -hmm. definitely something we got to talk about more because yeah, I'm I'm interested in getting some, some black vets on here um, to see, see what their experience is and why they join, how they join, and, and maybe what they got out of it. Mm-hmm. And if it's still, I'm sure there's still definitely some things we don't know about that's still going on with us black folk in the military. Yeah. Um, but, what else? But it was kind of like, we've talked about, <laughs> we talked about uh, the 1800s. We've talked about the 1900s. And, you know, for many people, they might say, that was a long time ago you know, get over it. But we can also look at what's happened in the 21st century or the 2000s as well and how that has only uh, rocked the Black and Latino communities even more in terms of diminishing their wealth. And um, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I I, want to really talk about this one, too, because it is a part of our recent history from the past, literally 10 years, right? Uh, we've seen and we still have been recovering from this. I don't think we got back to our rates pre, what, 20, 2008 up until okay. to 2014 is when we got back to those pre-2008 rates. Um, but this is important because when we looked at, like, Reconstruction, we look at the New Deal, the way the politicians package it is that it helps everyone. And, like, Daphne already addressed that, you know, Blacks in each period – did get some benefits, but we did not get our equal share, right, Mm -hmm. of what it should be. And it's kind of like what you said, Daph, that trickle-down effect when everything is booming. Yes, there are going to be some Blacks that are going to reap some of those benefits as well, which kind of mask it in a way that like, oh, well, Black people, some Black people are doing well, some Black people are going to the middle class, so it's good for everybody. When we're And we're not looking deeper into these issues. So this is why I want to address the, you know, what happened in 2008, but, but why we also need to keep um, an eye on what's going on and being said today because the politicians are going to do the same things. They're going to paint these rosy pictures. They're going to market it that it can benefit everyone, even things like with, um, you know, relieving uh, the mortgage crisis, which we talked about, not the mortgage, the uh, student loan debts. And now with Kamala Harris and talking about, you know, trying to do uh, provide a hundred billion dollars for housing for black folk and stuff like that. We just need to look at the fine print because we buy into it. Even when I was looking at, you know, just quickly going back when we were talking about FDR, even him getting into office, you know, a lot of it was the fact that, and this was one of the first time with the new deal and FDR being in that we started to hear the term liberal um, and black, it was due black grassroot activism that garnished a lot of his support and a lot of the black vote helped him get into office. Right. Mm-hmm. Because of the ideas of what he was promoting, what was on his uh, platform. And so black folks helped him get into office. He put out these ideas for everyone. And then black folks got got the crumbs right mm-hmm. out of all the stuff that was given out. And so I think I'm, I fear that these are the same things that happen, that um, a lot of the talking points are up there now because black folks have pushed over these past few years to get them on the table. I mean, this is the first time we ever hear politicians talk about things like reparations and stuff, you know, yeah. and specifically black related, black specific policies. Um, but then my fear is that like we've done this in the past, but we need to make sure that we get the bigger chunk of the pie, you know, or at least our fair share when it's all broken up. Um, uh, but anyway, I say, I say, let's talk 
quickly about, you know, what happened with the 2008 depression. Um, and, uh, you know, for those of you, you know, this is our recent history. So I'm sure most of us in our generation are very familiar with this because this was like definitely a highlight in our generation when it comes to the depression. Although we were all fairly young uh, for the most part, probably at least. And I guess we were in college and stuff like that. So we weren't too Yeah, young. but that's when... I know when we were graduating, everything mm-hmm. was falling apart. And I know yeah. a lot of my college educated friends, they were graduating and having to work these horrible jobs. Yeah. Just, yeah there were no true. jobs for them. Yeah, you're right. So we, I think we were the f- kind of the generation to, you know, graduate like with the high expectation of getting jobs and starting our lives and then realize like, oh, we can't do that. Mm-hmm. And I think that also, well, I'll get to that in a second, because I think that also lends into this whole uh, student loan debt thing as mm-hmm. well, how they both go hand in hand. Um, but one of the reasons uh, for the depression or the recession during this time period had to do again with housing. Um, and, uh, you know, and I guess during, oh, well, Reagan came in um, in the 80s. And one of the biggest things that he did was kind of, remove all these regulations that stem from the new deal mm-hmm. in a way on these financial institutions and banks. And so again, the reason why FDR did that was because without the regulations, the banks put us in a great depression. And so Reagan was like, Hmm, you know what? Let's remove these regulations. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go back to where we were. Let's go back. Let's give them, everything is good now. Let's give them another shot. And so, you know, in between that time period in the early 2000s, without these regulations and a whole bunch of other stuff happened, you know, where the federal government also took eyes off of, you know, financial crimes, right? They kind of defunded a lot of the um, agencies that are used to spot these type of crimes, which you need to put money for because it's different than crimes you find on the street, right? Because you have to have, you have to be educated for somebody to find tax fraud or embezzlement, right? Uh, it takes a, a certain level of expertise to, to have people look at these things. So when you're removing people, you're defunding these areas, of course, less eyes means that the people who want to do wrong are going to be able to do it because it's the, the likelihood of them getting, getting caught are are just probably non-existent. Mm-hmm. Um, so these de- deregulations, uh, the banks began to figure out new ways to kind of capitalize and make money. And the same way they did it before the Great Depression is the same way they did it this time around. And it had to do with the housing market. Yeah. Um, and one of the clever things they ch- decided to do was this thing called subprime mortgages. Mm-hmm. And the, the, the quick definition of subprime mortgages is that they pretty much gave people the, the subprime, right? The the root word of that is that if you're a prime, um, I guess a prime credit, a credit, if you have prime credit, right? Somebody with yeah. good credit, mm-hmm. you were able to, you know, get mortgage without eat more, get mortgages and loans easily. So people who didn't have good credit were subprime, right? So you were not ideal. And so they created these incentives to give people mortgages and loans who were not um, strong with their credit history, mm-hmm. okay, uh, which already is just not <laughs> a good thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but anyway, they sold people in by giving them these low interest rates, right? So you pretty much you can have a terrible credit, you can get a loan, and then initially you would have affordable interest rates. Yeah. Um, but the way it got tricky is, you know, the subprime mortgages is that they would begin to. I guess, sell them, if you will, on Wall Street in a way, right? By these things called derivatives, which I try to look into. I just know it's a really complicated thing. But essentially, I think what it is, is just like they're betting on the future value of these mortgages, of people being able to pay them back. Mm-hmm. Are you familiar with derivatives, Daph? You ever you uh, about them ever? Or, or, I mean, it's complicated financial transaction. Yeah, no, <laughs> I, I guess another way to think about it is they call it uh, securitization, where uh-huh. before the 1980s, lenders, um, like what they lended in terms of like um, home homes or loans or whatever, it was backed by what they actually had. Mm-hmm. But uh, like in the 19, either 1980s or 1990s, they kind of uh, divided up the system to where uh, they split apart loan origination from loan services. And like you said, they started selling loans. And because they were starting to be, instead of being like these back bank loans, they like kind of sold them as 
bundles uh, or as like financial investment. So it opened up the pool of money that banks had because they didn't need to have like the capital there for the loans because they were, you know, the system no longer had to be like uh, secured. Yeah. So, yeah, that's what you say. So essentially the banks didn't have to actually have the money. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And of course, so if the banks had a million dollars, but we have to keep, we can only give a million dollars worth of loan because that's all we can back. Right. And so, yeah, that makes sense. What you're saying is that they essentially that was lifted. And so <laughs> they were able to essentially uh, give and out mortgages more than they had. Than more than they had. Um, and I think this is a quote from, uh, I can't remember the name of this book, uh, if I remember later, but it's a chapter from this book uh, called, um, the chapter is called Framing the Freeing of the Sweets. And it says the key to derivatives is that those who buy and sell them are each making a bet on the future value of that asset. So it's at the heart of the business dance with time. Essentially, um, it wasn't anything, again, the the, the loans not being secured, but also the buying and selling of these derivatives was nothing secure as well. It was kind of just like, if it all goes well, this is how much it's going to cost. So you should purchase it now because you'll make X amount of money mm-hmm. on the future value of this. Um, and and so to, I guess, bring it back to how it gets to our, our conversation about race and stuff like that is that when we talk about, again, subprime lending, who do you think they were targeting? Right, with exactly. these kind of, oh. mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and, oh, go ahead. You about to say something? I was just about to say, yeah, like uh, ind- independent mortgage mortgage brokers, they were just like handing out loans, like handing out candy to children because they did not have to deal with the repercussions. They hand, you know, they originated these loans and then they immediately sold them off. So it was just kind of like they didn't bear the risk of like risky lending practices. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I and and I read somewhere a while back in one of my classes that even the way the politicians framed it, and this is why I want to mention this because it's very similar to the language that we're hearing today where they were trying to help uh, low-income communities of color. So they're saying, okay, hey, we have this new uh, financial instrument that allows people who have bad credit to act, get their own property and now have assets to help decrease the gap between the black and white you know, racial uh, wealth gap. Mm-hmm. And so it was sold with that exact language to communities of color. Mm-hmm. And then they targeted these communities, giving them these subprime loans, right? Mm -hmm. And I feel like uh, another thing you mentioned, because you you mentioned like the low interest rates, but a really big part of this Mm -hmm. is they sold the people on these low interest rates, but did not tell them they were variable. Yes. (laughs) And so at a time where like our economy is like really strong, these variable rates are low. But, you know, when stuff starts to hit the fan, they raise through the roof. So your payment that was like, five, six hundred dollars a month has now ballooned to like over a thousand dollars. And you maybe cannot afford that on your current income. And, you know, that's kind of like like that's when things started to like go out of control. And like we started seeing like the foreclosure crisis. Mm -hmm. So that's important because that variable interest is what wound up hitting a lot of people of color or well, most people with these subprime because you're already giving it to a um, kind of an economically unstable population, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so some people were paying with the regular mortgage with the interest, right? But some people were only doing interest only payments. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And so with it being variable, one of the reasons it was variable is because the financial institutions were selling these loans, right? And so uh, then if it you would sell it, the mortgage or the loan to somebody else, they can change the interest rate if they want to make more money. And so one day your payment might be $1,000 and then a couple months later, it's $2,500. And somebody already with kind of a set income or already kind of stressed financially, that's a lot of money, mm-hmm. right? And then you begin defaulting. But what happened at the same time is this, And how the bubble eventually bursts is because, as you said, um, people start to lose trust in these derivatives. People start to realize that uh, we're heading into trouble and uh, the value of people's homes drastically decreased as well. Mm -hmm. So you couldn't refinance to help 
fix things, right? Because now your home is wor worth less than what you got the original mortgage for. And so most people were just intentionally defaulting because the, the interest was too high and they the, the value of the home was low. So it was a lose-lose either way. So they're not paying anybody any money, you know, and moving and taking the credit hit or going filing for bankruptcy or what have you uh, because it was no longer the best financial option to try to kill yourself to pay off these loans when it didn't work out. Mm -hmm. And eventually everything bust you know, with the financial crisis, bust open, the bubble bust, all that kind of stuff. And then it put us into the depression. Um, and, you know, the biggest part of this is, you know, I can remember like after, you know, 2008 and like, you know, going into like the early like 2010s the neighborhoods that were most impacted by this bubble bursting um, were predominantly black neighborhoods. You see homes foreclosed on, home like uh, boarded up. Like it was these African-American neighborhoods that were just like so depressed. And it was interesting and I'm happy, you know, I had this opportunity. So when I was in college, so between 2004 and 2008. So at the time that like the housing market was, you know, really, you know, just at the top of its game, I worked at an escrow title company every mm -hmm. summer. Um, and so I started to like learn how real estate worked. And it was interesting how over the courses of the summer that I worked there, how like things were like the first summer, they were like, OK, we were busy, but it wasn't that bad. But it was just kind of like as the summers went on, like we were closing so many houses in a day that it was ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. like I actually and it was kind of like, oh, I need to get into real estate because it just seemed like people were getting rich real quick. Like seriously, like I saw it because, you know, I helped like type in some of the information in the contract. Like and. Interestingly, because I worked there, I was able to actually I learned about like the different types of like mortgages and I learned about interest rates. And I was actually able to advise some of my family members like, hey, oh, you're about to buy a house. You know, make sure you have like a fixed rate and not a variable rate. And I'm so happy I did that because I mean, I'm pretty sure like my family experienced like trouble or issues, but like no one was foreclosed on. And I wonder if I didn't have that knowledge, would somebody in my family have taken like a variable rate and have been in like a really bad situation? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, especially during that time period, I'm sure they would have been um, because that, those interest rates would have just skyrocketed. Yeah. And so it's interesting, like even just like, yeah, like you said, those life, your life experiences helped you gain the knowledge of kind of, how these things operate. Mm -hmm. And we even talk about those things, just access to opportunities or experiences. When you talk about even like standardized testing and how they can be culturally biased because there might be some words, like when you talk about vocab, that white kids just know because, you know, they experience like going on a certain type of boat or waters or bays or traveling, right? That you just learn as you go, not necessarily that they've read this in a book. And so it's even that just kind of financial literacy and stuff like you had. Was, be, was a result of you being uh, working in that setting, mm -hmm. which, you know, gave you the insight to protect yourself, your family from those kind of future endeavors. So that's yeah. just interesting how things play out like that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so, the, you know, the, the housing market, when it crashed, it affected black folks and, you know, people of color and all, all around. Even, even I want to quick just say this too, because it's important because even subprime mortgages were targeted to even middle-class blacks too. Yeah. <laughs> and so this means that black middle-class blacks who had these like, Oh, this sounds good. Oh, I can save a lot of money. And they got it. And then they're living in these middle-class suburban neighborhoods and then they're affected by it, but their neighbors aren't right. Because they were targeted for these loans more so than their neighbors. Similar how we talked about redlining and all this other stuff, how, they specifically give or don't give things to black folk, right? That eventually winds up harming us more than anybody else. And so this is one of those ways like, oh, these lenders, like, oh, let's give it to black folks, middle class, poor, whatever you, even though they were prime lenders, they were still getting offered these subprime mortgages. Yes, that is exactly the truth. Like people who had the credit score, and this happens in car lending as well. You might have the credit score that would say that you 
are eligible for these prime loans and they still don't give it to you. Oh, yeah, they don't. Uh, And so that's why it's also important for you to know your credit score and what you're worth. Mm-hmm. Before you go into these institutions and because I know like when we recently bought a car, I was like, I know our credit score is this, but both I we like this deal is off if we have an interest rate higher than this because our credit score would dictate that we have this. So, hey, if you want to if you want to sell a car today, you're going to make sure it don't go over this amount. And I was mm-hmm. dead. I was dead ass, as they say. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. No, you got to be. You got to be. Like, I remember when I got my car um, and doing a lot of research, Kristen and I, then, you know, we both had good credit and, you know, but understanding how they try to play you. So I went in there already from a, I went to a credit union and got a pre-approved loan who I know is going to treat me fair because credit unions already have good low interest rates. And because my credit was good, I had a really low interest rate. And so I went to all these car dealers and was like, listen, I don't need your loan. You know, I don't need yours. I got my own with a good interest rate. Um, and then if you want me to have yours, because there's always financial incentives, you're going to have to do better than what they're giving me, which was already a really good rate. Okay. And then so I went to some establishments and they were like, no, because they were, they got actually literally like annoyed that I came in there already with my own stuff and low interest rate. Right. Mm-hmm. But then uh, one, eventually they really wanted my business and then they actually gave me a lower one. So I was like, OK, you was able to bargain that way. And so I went with them. But I mean, these are things that we don't know. Right. And you have to be taught or you do experience or research. And they usually get us because you feel like, oh, I have a good interest rate. They're automatically going to give me the best deal mm-hmm. when they're not because the interest rate puts money in their pockets. Um, so they're going to try to get you and play you in that way. Uh, but yeah, yeah, don't don't get got by these these car loans for sure because yeah. there's a lot of predatory lending when it comes to those 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 loans smaller than home loans and mortgages mm-hmm. they'll get you mm-hmm. i think another thing that really bothered me about this some subprime lending foreclosure crisis is so they started to uh finally give mortgages in um predominantly black areas that they previously saw as risky. They did so with, you know, risky mortgages and subprime mortgages. Those, a lot of those homes went into foreclosure, which kind of like created economically depressed, uh, predominantly black neighborhoods. And then after the foreclosure crisis, who came and scooped up those houses? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. You already know. (laughs) And now a lot of them are like... uh, rental properties mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. they're gentrifying those I would say led to the, led to more gentrification yeah. for sure because like oh this is on the low well eventually they're gonna go back up and we can take the financial risk because we're good mm-hmm. and then yeah make a profit off of this and now they are owning our neighborhoods yeah but buying up the whole block after they sold us these risky mortgages and caused us to go into foreclosure. It's cray cray. Uh, it, it's, it's wild, man. It's just how it all plays a role. And then how we kind of talked about earlier, right? Because again, it, what happened is so many, especially we're talking about 2008, you have one end of so many of people like us graduating, can't find any jobs. Then you have a lot of people who were working and lost their jobs. And so what are people going to do? Well, let me buy some time for it to correct itself and go back to school. Mm -hmm. And so by doing that, well, even though we stopped the financial institutions from being uh, predatory when it comes to housing, well, now they see a new market. Oh, everybody's going to school now. So now we can loan in a different way with these student loans. And so you see a lot of predatory lending in that way. You see a lot of uh, banks giving out tons of student loans because it became a high market and though these interest rates, they'll get it back eventually. And it seems like, you know, students would be a safer bet because, hey, they're going to college. We know people go to college, get jobs, uh, but they weren't factoring in that. And people aren't getting jobs or getting paid the way like they need to to pay off these loans. And so now we're finding ourselves in another similar situation where these these banks have all these loans and the people are defaulting. They can't pay them back. They don't have enough money. They're still living at home or what have you. And we're now about to head into what some think maybe another crisis. Right. Um, So this is you know, you hear people like Elizabeth Warren talking about. Uh, reducing the loan. One is to because if we don't do anything, we're probably going to another crisis. But then you hear about all these states giving free tuition and stuff like that is because they're trying to get ahead of the the curve a little bit. 
mm. when it comes to these student loans. It's not all because they just want to help out everyone from the bottom of their heart. It's because they're trying to get ahead of in case it does crash because of student loans. They don't want to be hit by it too much. And I was about to say, um, in terms of like the predatory lending, what has been, I guess, the one of the toughest situations in like the rise of like this, you know, student loan lending is that it was also coincided with the rise of these for profit colleges that weren't actually able to guarantee or their outcomes for students did not match uh, the amount of debt students was taken were taken out because mm-hmm. they weren't accredited institutions. So you had like students taking out these loans, federally backed loans. Um, a lot of them use them as refund checks. I mean, hey, yeah, hey. yeah of course. I mean, I mean, to pay to pay for your rent or get you food or you know to survive. Um, but you know, a lot of these colleges have closed down now. Um, a lot of the times, like the curriculum didn't match what they needed, so they weren't actually able to get the jobs that they expected. So it's kind of like that was another predatory thing. And we have Betsy DeVos in office, and I mean, she. She either owns one or is like heavily involved with like the for profit thing. And she was really trying to fight against giving student debt relief to uh, these former students of for profit colleges who were kind of duped and like put in so much debt that they literally could not afford to pay back because they did not have the credentials to actually get the jobs that they needed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And yeah, a lot of times, you know, with these loan what's different than like mortgages is like these student loan things, is like you could get it for a semester or a year, and then once the school get it gets it, they has they have their money. And everything else is between the bank or whoever lended it and the person who took the money. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is why a lot of those private schools who were doing that, those kind of profit driven schools, because regardless, they get their money, whether the student succeeds or not, gets a job or not, they get their money from the bank. That's signed, sealed and delivered. Mm-hmm. Um, and they don't care what happens. So I think there definitely has to be more onus put on these schools. I feel like there should be like a tuition based system on the kind of you know, employment opportunities your students get afterwards, right? Mm-hmm. Like, so if you have a lot of students not getting high paying jobs, your tuition should be low. But if you're at a top school where you're just pumping out all these students that are making, you know, six figures at least, then yeah, okay, you can have a higher tuition because the you'll get more back. Um, but a lot of these schools, like you said, just schools in general have all these tuitions, but students aren't getting guaranteed jobs. So it's like, what? But then there's this debate even within higher education is, should colleges be used for that, right? Should it be, should, should colleges are were initially just about education per se, not about job getting. So a lot of times you hear a lot of students in college, even my students would be like, oh, I'm just here so I can get a good job. But what is, what is the value of education? Aren't you supposed to be in college just to, just to learn, right? Find something you're interested in and become uh, more, get more in-depth knowledge about it, expertise, or is it like this factory now for producing better employees mm-hmm. um, is a debate, which should be called, but that's a whole different c- conversation. But anyway. Uh, you know, just so you guys know, uh, you know, This might be another reason why you look at Biden with the side eye, but he was actually one of the people on the committee that like uh, kind of made it a law that you could not discharge student loan debt in a bankruptcy. Mm, (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Uh, and what's crazy is in, I think, 1997, uh, a National Bankruptcy and Review Commission formed under, you know, Clinton. And they kind of advised that student loans be made dischargeable again, like any other private consumer debt. However, once again, a Biden favored, uh, Biden favored industry professionals view and limited bankruptcy protection to those who could, uh, prove their failure to pay uh sprang from undue hardship so wow mm, mm. okay <laughs> all right mr biden all right yeah that's that's not good um yeah i mean that's but that bring that's good because that brings us to just you know we need the reason why we spent some time this episode after i wanted to just cover this because it's good to give just a little 
a perspective and kind of just like look at the trends over these over these years of how policies have been implemented, but black folks have really never gotten our fair shake. And although things are sounding great right now from some of these politicians, like tuition and housing and all these other things, you know, the deeper question I'm continuously asking is, how can we ensure that that is going to come right to us? Mm. Um, because the government will say these grandiose things and gen- speak generally and everyone will be a part of, even people like Booker, even people like uh, Bernie Sanders, right? This, well, everyone's going to benefit when they're asked questions specifically about race and things like that. It's, he, they continuously hold on to that talking point that once we get the money out of the, the big corporates, whatever, everyone will be affected and the black communities will be affected specifically. Oh, no, nah, I can't believe that anymore. You know, I just by you saying that it's going to be this trickle down. Yes, some will, as we've seen in the past, but the gra- the vast majority of us will not reap those benefits if we don't begin to specifically ask for how is this going to connect the dots, how is it going to affect our communities? Mm-hmm, yeah. mm-hmm. Um, and that was why I had those questions about the Kamala Harris Black home ownership plan, because it's like, yo, will we really benefit? Like, especially millennials who like people like to throw shade at. But if we really, you know, if we're honest with ourselves, the millennials, they came of age during the freaking foreclosure crisis and the great recession and now the student loan debt crisis. So it's kind of like, you know, don't tell me I have to have stayed in a red lined area for the past 10 years when realistically I'm I'm 33. Like I've spent my twenties grinding, trying to make a living for myself. So. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and, and the thing is like her, her policy is mainly, you know, looking at, helping people with, uh, you know, down payments and stuff, mm-hmm. you know, which is good to help subsidize down payments. I think people might get up to like $25,000 to help that kind of stuff. So it's good to help you get into a home. Um, uh, but again, it, it's, it's, it's like when you get into the home and the mortgages and those practices, we've seen hurt folks. So, uh, and getting access to these homes and, and what kind of homes and the value of these homes, there's a lot more to it. And I, I just don't, I just don't know if I can fully buy the idea that getting black folks in the homes will automatically reduce the gap, you know, because there's a lot of other financial, um, I guess, things and and I perspectives around that that also incorporate just having the property doesn't mean the gap is decreased right mm-hmm. it's like if you can't pay for the property you don't have money to do other things or your value your, your, your uh, kind of lifestyle uh, the way you're living isn't st- still kind of low income right you can't enjoy recreational activities because you're just affording a mortgage and that's it I don't know I just feel like there's a lot of other things that need to go into it and finding building financial literacy within our communities as well I um, agree but I think people will jump on those talking points, you know, like, oh, help me with a down payment. Great. And but like there's a lot more to owning the house than the down payment. Mm-hmm. I agree. But yeah, um, other policies that I just, you know, kind of hope are implemented. I want to see some tuition assistance. I want to see some student debt relief. Um mm-hmm. Yeah, just just all of those things. But I do want to I don't want to hear anything about no trickle down. I'll just say that. And for you listeners who were already on board, I'm people like, oh, you preaching to the choir. But for those who may be listening, who maybe didn't know these things, maybe didn't know why people were so like gung ho or fighting to say like, hey, no, speak to me directly. Uh, Mm -hmm. This is kind of why. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. I think some people just a lot of people just hear race or hear black and be like, oh, you know, we're all going to get left out. How can we all can't? But it's not about that. It's that we are just so far behind in a lot of ways that we we need some assistance in these communities to give us um, a fighting chance. Right. To catch up, to close the gap. It's not to take away from anybody. You guys or what I'm just talking about, white folks specifically have been to proponents and beneficiaries of these policies since the inception of America. (laughs) Um, And most of those policies have been race specific, whether said explicitly or implicitly. And so now to, if we really to correct these things, it's okay to support these policies because it will better our country, the country in the long run. Mm. Um, 
Uh, but it's like, you know, people already got a bigger piece of the pie. Keep asking for an even bigger piece while people who are getting crumbs or, or you know, you're getting mad because people are getting crumbs just want a bigger slice. So yeah. it's not fair. Yeah. And, like, and like Daphne said, sometimes it may feel like we are preaching to the choir. But I but the what I urge all our listeners to do is, you know, share episodes like this or all our episodes, because sometimes people who might not have the same perspective will listen. Right. And maybe that'll change or maybe they'll be a little bit more informed of some of the points you may be supporting. Right. And you can point them to a resource now and be like, here, just check this out. Listen to this. Click on the resources, read up on it, and then let's have a discussion um, as far as, you know, what you're hearing and what you're digesting. Because uh, sometimes, yeah, preaching other folks. It's just a, a tough thing to do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it wasn't always receptive. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, um, share, share with your friends. What I say, share with your enemies. <laughs> <laughs> share with everybody, definitely. Uh, but no, this was a good episode. And uh, um, if you guys have any feedback for us, for sure, um, hit us up. You know, email us at bhcpodcast at gmail.com. Um, uh, and visit our website blackandhollydangerous.com to keep with all our latest content review and rate us if you haven't did that yet and you enjoy this episodes and the free content you know just do something for us and go out there and just you know click click the stars and, and write a nice review that really helps us and we really do read the reviews and, and take them into account so anything any feedback uh hit us up and like daphne already alluded to uh share us with your friends share us with your family and share us with your enemies and as always continue to be the oppressor's worst fear If you're interested in continuing this and other conversations, visit our website, blackandhollydangerous.com to subscribe to our email list, suggest topics, and participate in our discussion forums. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at BHD Podcast. And please don't forget to subscribe and rate our podcast on your favorite platform. And as always, continue to be the oppressor's worst fear.